after the game, I had like all these fans outside in Scotland and Edinburgh. They were like, Seb, Seb, can we get a picture? And then like, I would get the phone and like do a selfie. And then every one, there's a wooden spoon. Oh, and I was like, these bastards. guys taking, I was like, these yes. bastards taking the purse, man. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pass Offload with Ryan Wilson and Max Leaf and shortly we'll be joined by a man who's just been named in the Six Nations team of the tournament in Italy, Sebastian Negri. But uh, before we get into all the chaos and controversy from a final weekend of Six Nations action, Max, amazingly, you've rocked up on a podcast. It's good, it's good last to have week? you. It's good to have you, Max. Thanks for coming. Why are you insinuating? <laughs> just no showed. Oh, I'm guessing you didn't watch back the episode last week where you just didn't turn up, the one that you went to Cheltenham instead by accident. Oh, come now. You guys set me up. You wanted a nice icebreaker and that's what you got. No. I heard all don't. about it. I heard all about it from my own padre. He, he's a he's a loyal listener and he had a good chuckle. Very good chuckle as you were slagging me off zealously. How was Cheltenham, Max? How was oh, it? Oh, lads. Oh. It was it was very good. It was all as always. It delivers like the milkman. It was outrageous. Um, saw the bath lads. The refs were there. I was getting into Christoph uh, Ridley and uh, Hamish at the retreat. Have you been to the retreat? Little little seedy sort of red walled pub right in the heart of Cheltenham. And I had the Duke, the Duke himself, Henry Purdy, showing me the ropes. He's lived there since day one. My God, the man is so, so majestic. But yeah, it was an outstanding day out, mate. Very, very fun. Bit of you, 100%. Just the one day? Just the one day after that, like Wednesday, first day. My God, the demons are real. Do you know, like that, that alcoholic come down? My God, no good. No good to anyone. It's anyone's. not, it's not uh, sometimes I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, no, genuine. I was like, every time I do it, I'm like, I should just abolish drinking. Yeah. I thought I thought about that at the weekend, the old Guinness zero point zero, and then just peeling the thing off so no one gets stuck into me and just pretend that I'm drinking. Yeah. I reckon I could do it and still act like a complete idiot as well. I know, one hundred percent. Talk us through another weekend of corporate schmoozing. No, it was good. Spent some time with my old mate uh, Hoggy and Finn Russell, um, a few of the injured boys there, so they were kicking about. So yeah, it was lovely. It was actually quite nice. Good to catch up with those boys. Uh, let's talk about Ireland igniting St. Patrick's Day weekend celebrations by clinching the Grand Slam in Dublin for the first time in their history. The battling 29-16 bonus point win over 14-man England. Boys, let's start with the obvious one, the controversial steward red card. Some are saying it, one of the worst calls ever. Others siding more with the outcome. What are, your, what are your thoughts? Yay or nay? Max, you know what I'm thinking with this red card, so give it to me. What we're saying, we're saying it's nothing, just a rug, just a penalty. Absolute madness that he's he's given him red. I couldn't believe it. I was as mm-hmm. shocked as Owen Farrell was when he's like, <laughs> You know what? <laughs> what I was a... red. It's how quick he moved with it, though. There's no messing about. He was like, That's a red. Uh, who was it? Went through the framework, time? but it was he did it so like quickly. Honestly, I, c- I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I I don't think there's there won't be many people out there that will think that was a red card. It's a clear rugby incident. The ball's bouncing. He's bending over to catch it. His last at pace. Moment. At pace. He's he's coming onto it as well. Exactly. He could be coming in to fly hack that. Whatever. Yeah. Exactly. What else did you want him to do? When you're watching it on slow mo, it's just the the perspective is just so so like it's just surreal because you can watch it frame by frame. <laughs> And in real life, it just doesn't work like that. Like Freddie Stewart's just trying to like brace for impact because he knows it's coming. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think it's a, a mad decision. Rugby collision. We've got to do something about yeah. it. That thing. Is- the system being used in the Southern Hemisphere's uh, Super Rugby comp for incidents that aren't clear after a couple of replays. Referees encouraged to show a yellow card. Then while the player's off the field, the TMO has eight minutes to decide whether that yellow card should be upheld yeah. or upgraded to a 20-minute red card would players prefer that that's what we've been asking for forever that is yeah. since, since, since ireland v france last year what's remember the, that's penalty? what we were talking about yeah. yeah that that just works that's perfect stick it in there it's perfect i think it's a good idea i think we go go for it and just trial it because at the moment these red cards are ruining games and could possibly have ruined that game did you see um 
the halftime debate between Clive and Brian, Big Bod and Clive Woodward getting spicy. Oh, they didn't have the sound on very loud in the pub. So. Oh, man, it was tasty. I was enjoying it. So Br- Brian O'Driscoll was obviously like siding with Bianco Paper. And then Clive's like, this is a rugby incident. And Brian's like, no, but by the letter of the law, by the framework, he's correct. Oh, in his really? Decision. Yeah, it was, I was I was like, yeah, you know what? This is, yeah, like both convictions, but both of them were going into it. It was lovely. There was a real emotional sort of conviction to both of their narratives. I was enjoying that mu- very much. Are these kind of softer red cards, if we can use it in this term, ruining the spectacle of rugby and rugby as a whole? Do you know what I was thinking about the other day because of this? I digress for like that, but I was thinking of 90s wrestling, like noughties and 90s wrestling. Do you remember like Mankind and Undertaker and that? And they were like jumping into like beds of pins off like 15 feet. You never see that anymore in wrestling. And there's probably a good reason for that again. But that spectacle of watching people put themselves in serious risk is is meaningful in some kind of way. It's like why we're attracted to the sports. It's why we're attracted to sort of lots of man sports. I think risk and danger are synonymous with a lot of people's lives for living with meaning. Like you don't get like guys like Travis Pastrama, he's not going to live a sanitary lifestyle of health and safety, is he? He just needs that to be who he is. But it's they're trying to fight a battle with the sort of degenerative conditions that can be associated with repeated head knocks. And that's a hard line to sort of to to flirt with, you know, like to get that right. But yeah, it, it, no doubt it, it's it's uh, it's sort of watering down the the sort of confrontational element of the game. Exactly it, what Max says. What Max said, I'm with him. No, but it's true. You're talking the spectacle of all that. But also, if we bring in the fact that at a particular incident in the England game, Lewis Ludlam had a shoulder driven into his head. He didn't seem to react. Nothing was done about it. We've seen now players going down a bit more. Or it, have you guys noticed on the field an increase in play acting since the TMOs have become more active? Yeah, let's 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 be honest. There's been a little bit, hasn't there? There's been a, a few funnies. We could talk about Nick White in particular against South Africa. That was that was pretty egregious. Um, and then there was obviously Owen Farrell's gamemanship with Sexton when Sexton clutched his head. He was like, this guy needs to go off for a HIA. So he was trying to get Johnny Sexton off the field because he thought Sexton was milking someone. And then obviously that Lewis Ludlam incident, which is, is making the rounds on Twitter. Um, yeah, it, it makes it makes it, it, it adds another element, doesn't it? There's definitely a case of milking it. There's definitely a case of players yeah. milking it more and more now. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And that's that's the problem. It's those those people that are milking it and they're making it worse because then you are bringing the rep into it. Just get on with it. Ireland seemed to struggle to find any rhythm or they weren't their usual efficient selves. Do we think if Stuart isn't red carded, do England go on to win that game? I don't think so. England had nothing to lose. Ireland had a whole grand slam to lose, so there was more pressure on them, but they're number one for the reason at the moment. They've been, um, they've been another level. And they've shown that with Leinster. They've shown that with the players that they're bringing in. Like, everything they've gone through the Six Nations, just another level. So I could never see them losing that game. Even if England had 15, I think they would have come out on top. Yeah, I'd, I'd never say never. But no doubt, losing Stewart, that's, he's probably the form England player at this point. So losing a guy like him is, is significant. But if anything, Ireland get better over, over games. Do you know what I mean? They just They seem to just flex the muscles over very minutes and then suddenly you're down like 20 points they're, they're that dangerous so it's difficult to suggest that I'd, I'd, I'd say Ireland also would have would have gone on to 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 vanquish England eventually yeah has there been a more deserved winner of a grand slam over the last sort of five ten years if we take it in you know what the way they came about it having to play a France team that was on such a long unbeaten run they're the best Irish team I've seen. A grand slam. That's no no mean feat. That, that, that team's just a full of assassins, absolute green ninjas everywhere. Um they're outstanding. I love I love watching them. Do you know what's good about them as well? Their defense. I think they only yeah. let they let in the least amount of tries, which and no one really talks about it. And is it Easter B? Is that the defense coach? Yeah. You're right. Everyone talk the way that everyone talks about, you know, the Sean Edwards, the Steve Tandys, like the Sinfields. 
And you've got a bloke there that gets no mention whatsoever, like barely gets any sort of plaudits, but they've got the best best defence going and they're bloody good in attack. But actually, when people can't, aren't scoring tries against you, they're not going to beat you. All right, we are delighted to be joined by a man who made more metres than any other forward in the championship, was named in the team of the tournament, Italy's number six, Sebastian Negri. Welcome on the podcast. How's it going, Seb? <clears throat> no, all good. Thanks so much for having me. Look at that rustic roof. You're obviously back in oh, Italy, yeah. surely. Yeah, back in back in Italy into training tomorrow with Benetton. So yeah, oh. it's gonna be pretty, pretty tough. Especially <laughs> after especially after Saturday night in, in Edinburgh. Oh, lovely. Lovely. <laughs> what happened on Saturday night? Os Wilson, he was there. No, I wasn't. <laughs> Such a liar. Liar, Wilson. We, we, we've just had a chat on here about how I took it easy this weekend because I'm back playing this week. <laughs> no, I was there. Remember drinking no, the Guinness 0.0s? Zero yeah, you're well, be, you're well behaved for the first time I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, won't get in, we won't get into that. We won't get into that Rome night that we had uh, a couple of years ago. We can, we can. Yeah, we are. Ago, but, um, <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Franco, Franco Smith was, uh, yeah, he, he was waiting for me this morning when I came in. So I'm like, oh, God. Oh, oh God. <laughs> You'll be getting you to do the washing machine for sure. Oh, mate, we've done it. We've done it plenty of times. Terrible, he loves terrible. that thing. He absolutely yeah. loves that thing. But no, um, Rome, a couple of years ago. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure, get... I'm sure you took your, your kilt off at one stage. But I'm not, I'm not 100 all the Ita- you had all the Italian birds going nuts. Ah, that's that's a lie, surely. Yeah, that is a lie. Like, no, I, mean... really too nice. I tell you what, there's Art Cafe, by the way. That is yeah. uh, that is some that is some gaff over there. No, the it's a good cafe. spot. It's a good spot. Oh, we, me and Dave Denton got left in there one night with the oh, wow. uh, with, with the bill that no one had paid, <laughs> and we thought we were getting free drink all night until they threw us the bill. Oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah. Wait, hang on, Seb. Don't you know Dave Denton in a yeah like we family grew, setting? Yeah, we grew up together, and he's my mum's uh, godson. Oh, there you are. the yeah. dentist. I must yeah. have known that at some point. Yeah. So um, no, we go we go back a long way. It was actually yeah, that was my first Six Nations, and we played against uh, Scotland and Rome, and yeah, I got to grab Denton's jersey after the game, so it was pretty special. So you boys had a you had a few a few after the game and then straight back on the Sunday. Yeah, straight back on the Sunday and then obviously with Benetton we got two big games coming up um, to try and keep our playoff hopes alive in the URC. So this week we got the Lions. I'm not sure if all of us will play, so we'll see tomorrow. Um, and then definitely next week because we got the Challenge Cup playoff. And if we win that, then we got a home quarter final. So yeah, lots to lots to play for. There was a few dusty carcasses in Glasgow this morning. All the all the Glasgow all the boys were back in. Everyone was told they had to come in to sort of be told right. Oh, yeah. This is it. And then some of them sent away on holiday. But yeah, there's yeah. a few ropey ropey souls in there. Yeah, it's the same as us. It's the same as us. It's taken a lot. It's taken a lot out of us as as it always does. Talk us through what's probably a frustrating day on on Saturday for you. And yeah, you know, we were just talking about how bad the decision that Jaco Paper was to give uh, a red in the England match earlier versus Ireland, but mm. arguably even worse, the outcome uh, Angus Gardner's decision not to punish Scotland for being offside in the dying moments of that match. Yeah, it was it was frustrating because we were so close to just getting over the line. Um, I tried to have a chat with Matthew Carley after the game, telling him, "Mate, were you sleeping on that side?" Because also. And that last play, um, I'm sure one or two of the Scotland boys are offside when we pick and go and it gets turned over. So, yeah, we just seem, it's, we never get the rub at the green, um, which is frustrating. But, you know, if we if we have to look at ourselves, you know, we've, pre- we've left a lot of chances out there and that's probably been the story of our Six Nations. We haven't quite executed the way we, we wanted to in that final third. So... Yeah, obviously a lot, lot of disappoint, a lot of disappointment after the game. Um, it was the same against France. It was probably the same against Ireland at times. Uh, Wales, you know, I think against Wales we made eleven or twelve line breaks. Uh, we're not able to finish. So, 
yeah, very disappointed. But, you know, I think we, we went into the Six Nations wanting to get respect and credibility back, you know, from the outside world. And I think, you know, we're on to, on to something pretty special. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you judged on your results and another disappointing Six Nations, but a lot of positives to take forward for sure. No, you've definitely done what you set out to do. Like everyone's back yeah. talking about it, Lee, playing, talking about the brand of rugby that you're playing. Did you, what, like I, I even felt for you boys, see that that try at the end because penalty at the end again from that scrum, mm. and then everyone switches off a bit, and they're like, "Oh, right, Scotland will just boot it out," and they go the length. Yeah. That, you're a big Duan van der Merwe. Mm. You know, yeah. that's a that's a real killer blow because then. There's nothing worse than after the game you look at the scoreline and it doesn't really reflect yeah. what happened in the game. Like you said, there were so many opportunities you boys missed. Scotland the same, yeah. to be fair, but that must have been frustrating as well. Yeah, so frustrating. And the, the thing is, people who didn't didn't watch the game, they see the scoreline and they think, "Wow, well, Italy have been, you know, put away again, away from home, pretty, pretty uh, standard, I guess." Yeah. But um, I think huge positive is that we're getting that respect and credibility back. You know, people are talking about us and, you know, the brand of rugby rather than, you know, why Italy and the Six Nations. I think that's a massive, a massive uh, feather in our cap. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, we, I think, yeah, we've let ourselves down a little bit at times. So, um, yeah, lots to improve on, but definitely a, a, a good mood in the camp heading into, a, you know, a big summer and, and, and to the World Cup. I know it's not all down to him, right? But, and Tommy Allen, Galbisi mm -hmm. played outstandingly, were brilliant. Mm -hmm. But if you have Wee Ange on the pitch on Saturday. Yeah. No, listen, he's, yeah, he's world class. And, you know, we, you always want those sort of players in your team that, you know, can change a game in the blink of an eye. And I think he's definitely one of those. Um, he looks, <laughs> he doesn't look at, he's like, no, he's, Genuine, like one of those guys who just plays FIFA and and just takes it takes it easy, walks around the hotel, t tiny tiny bloke. But, but once you get a once he gets a rugby ball in his hands, he can change a game very quickly. And yeah, world class as he's shown on so many different occasions. Someone told me, is he French? But his Italian, his, his Italian's not great, and his English. Like, I I I might have had five or six good conversations with them throughout. Um, because his English isn't great, his Italian's not great. My Italian's terrible, so and I don't speak a word of French, so so it's pretty tough. But um, yeah, he's he's basically full full out French. That yeah, can obviously, yeah. yeah. So um, but no, a huge asset to us, and hopefully we can keep him fit for the World Cup because yeah, like I said, he's world class and he can change a game. And when you have those type of people in your team, you know anything can happen. What do you reckon's changed though? Like how what's galvanized you guys? I think Max, it's it's come from from the top. I think Kieran Crowley's been an awesome influence. Um, I think, you know, the way he manages us and the belief he's given us to just go out there and play, and um, I think that's filtered throughout the throughout the team. Um, and the environment in which he's created is is awesome. You know, you come in every day. It's it's a great place to be, and you know that's filtered through. But at the same time, you know, Italy have got a lot of young players that are coming through and, and top quality players, young young guys that are putting their hands up. And um, I think that helps, you know, and we, we, we're starting to create a little bit of depth. Um, you know, in past, if you picked up one or two, you know, serious injuries, then, you know, you could get blown away. But, you know, young guys have stepped in and, and done well. So, yeah, I think I definitely think it's the best environment that I've been in. Um, I've, I've obviously been in the Italy set up for a number of years now and yeah for sure this is this is a really good place to be and I think we're all buying into to what Kieran wants um, and I think we're definitely on the right track for sure Again it also feeds off of the club rugby you boys at Treviso have been going yeah. over the last few years haven't you and Yeah that, that's a massive help that's a massive help too because you know there's only two franchises um, obviously Zebra are, are struggling but you know, I think there's 18 or 19 of us in the Italy set up from Benetton. And, you know, we've had a really good year so far. Um, so, yeah, that form sort of carries in. You know, you look at the the young guys that have come through. I mean, Ancelo, Lorenzo Canone at eight. You know, these guys have been performing really well for Benetton. And that form's been taken into the Six Nations. Um, and those guys have also put up, put up their hands. So, um, yeah, I think that definitely right that that form comes through, comes through the URC and, and the club stuff. Just need Zebra to pull their finger out now. Yeah, exactly. I need to get on the phone to CC and tell him to wake <laughs> up. But I think, you know, I, I also think there's some good young players there. 
um, and they just need to get that, you know, yeah, you know, get get it, get it going there because that that'll help the the national team too. Is there a sense of the countries behind you a bit more now? You know, you're not you're no longer sort of gallant losers. You're not happy just competing. You've shown what you're capable of. You talked about the youth team who came third uh, in the under 26 nations, but have been performing very well for the last couple of years. Are they behind you now? The people of Italy noticing it more? For sure, hundred percent. I've ne- I've never felt like, especially during the Six Nations campaign, the the support that we've had back here. You know, you walk into Treviso and fans are chuffed and the way we're playing the same in Rome you know people are waiting for us at train stations and cheering us on so yeah it's been a a completely different experience to to any that I've um, had before and um, I think that helps you know when you play a brand of rugby that we're playing and we you know we're not just showing up and you know playing a boring style that maybe we stay in the game until 50-60 minutes and then we get battered so you know we just I think we're just playing an attacking brand and whatever happens, happens. As Kieran always says, just go out there, give it shit. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. But, you know, we want to be courageous. We talk about being uh, courageous all the time and and throwing the ball around. And, yeah, I think we're doing that. Just a quick one on your performances throughout the Six Nations. Uh, There's a lot of media saying that you could have perhaps won a couple of games with slightly better game management. Do you think at times you guys were guilty of overplaying? Because you seem to get the balance right for the Scotland game. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think so at times. Um, you know, it's probably something that we need to try and balance out, especially when we're exiting. Um, but our identity is that we want to play and, you know, we want to give it a crack. So, you know, you can't go into your shell too much because ultimately, you know, if you go into your shell, then you put yourself under more pressure. So, you know, I think if you if you go a bit too defensively, then we're falling back into sort of what we were doing before, and that obviously wasn't working when you were, when you know we are shipping fifty points a game. So, um, yeah, I think we just got to keep believing and keep buying into it, and just working on our execution um, because you know a lot of our a lot of our opportunities came from actually attacking in our own twenty two. Uh, Go BC. Uh, stepping into the sort of ten shirt beautifully, isn't he a bit lippy on the pitch? Yeah, I called him the C word when we played. I think it was Ireland because he told me to fold. I was like, "Shut up and let me do my role. Don't tell me what to do." Um, but now nah, he's he, man, He's to be fair, he's he's class, eh? Um, yeah, he manages us really well. He's obviously young, but you know, um, sort of got an experienced head on his shoulders. So, man, I think he's 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 awesome the way he communicates, and I think it helps having Tommy around too. Um, sort of bounce off each other, which is good. And um, no, nah, yeah, I think Paolo's Paolo's awesome. Um, I think it's been a little bit difficult for him this year because you know Montpellier has been playing a bit more at twelve, and you know because of their injuries and things, so probably hasn't taken you know that form that he would have wanted maybe into the Six Nations. But um, yeah, for sure we've got a world class ten there. You would have seen the Georgia. Over the weekend, won their 11th European Championship in 12 years. A lot of pressure. You would have been aware of them being given a shot in the in the main tournament. How do you think that issue is best sorted out? Listen, I think Georgia are a good side, and and I don't think it helped that we lost to them in the in the summer. Um, but you know, I think we're showcasing now that you know we we belong we belong in this tournament. We belong in the Six Nations. Um, also from November, you know, we 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 um, comfortably beat Samoa, then we beat Australia. Um, we were so close, so many on so many occasions. This Six Nations, so I thought I think we sort of squashing those sort of talks by the way we're performing, and that's the only thing we can do. Because if you asked me this question two three years ago, I probably would have said, "Fair enough, Georgia probably do deserve a shot. Um, there should be maybe a playoff or whatever, because ultimately you judged on your." your performances and your results. Um, but at the moment, I think, you know, we're showing, we show, we showcasing why we deserve to be in the Six Nations. I think we're making it a really good spectacle. And, you know, teams, when they play against us, have a bit more respect, as as Ryan touched on as well. And, um, you know, they don't just see us as, oh, we'll go to Rome and get an easy five points. I think uh, everyone has to fight for, fight for that win now against us. Speaking of fighting, and you, you, Italy putting down a marker in the Six Nations this year. You're incredibly physical on the pitch. Tell us about your fight with Owen Farrell at Twickenham, because that was a standout moment of the series. Right? 
Yeah. Now, well, just at half time, we we talked about getting a bit more physical and getting into the battle a bit more. And I thought, you know, the only way I'm going to do that is if I try and write someone off or try and put in a big big hit, um, just to sort of galvanise the boys. And you know, luckily I saw Farrell, you know, taking it to the line, and I was like, w whether he passes us or not, I'm going to try and floor him. Um, and then yeah, I just put my my hand in his face. Well, yeah, trying to get to, up. I could see that you were just yeah. trying to get up. Weren't no, you? genuine. I was so gassed as well, so I couldn't yeah. get up properly. And, that's and then your I hand to... turned into the forearm, and then you're trying to like, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I know what you're like. And then see yeah. you're down, you're just like, Help, so I'm trying to get up. I'm yeah. trying. Yeah. So difficult, and it, and you play a trick in that grass also is so slippery that <laughs> you know I couldn't I couldn't get up. Um, but no, there was nothing in it. There was no there was nothing in it. Genuine. Um, but it was this funny because, I, yeah. <laughs> because it was funny because I actually saw we played against Ireland the week the week after or the next the next Ireland game after that, and obviously his dad coaches Ireland and all the family were watching, and I've just seen like I've walked after the game through like you know where they do the post match function I've just seen the whole family like sort of this I don't know there was like a daughter or a sister someone like pointing at me going, you know that's the bloke that did that and I'm like basically walking past them like yes it's me and I can speak English that's my first language so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically that's fucking like, him that's that, there he is that's the fucking yeah. fuck <laughs> there's that dickhead who put his hand into Owen's face um, but listen there was nothing there was nothing in it so I got nothing against him or anyone I just you know I wanted to galvanize the boys and you know just put in the try to put in a big shot and you know, most of the time I get knocked over, so it was good to to um to get do it. You were heavily defended on this pod, but exactly like that by by Ryan. He he said <laughs> you uh, you you you'd lost your footing and and all sorts of other uh, yeah. excuses coming from Ryan. But talking about being aggressive on the pitch last year, you nearly lost your life against England before Ellis Genge came to the rescue. Who, for yeah. those who don't know what happened, take us through what unfolded. Well, I don't really remember too much of the week <laughs> and the game because you know I've taken the I've obviously watched the video afterwards, but I took the ball into contact and I think I made contact with um with um, I'm not sure who it was, but anyway I've made contact with my head and fallen asleep for for four minutes. Took a big big knock, um, and Ellis has taken put me on my side and taken my gum shield out because I was choking, um, and yeah almost. Yeah, almost almost died. I would say because you know if he hadn't taken my gum shield out, there was a possibility that I would have choked. Um, so yeah, massive thank you to him. Obviously, I've I've spoken to him, and um, you know when you look back at things like that, it's it's pretty scary. Um, but now it was good to a really good thing that he did, and yeah, obviously my my parents were watching back in Zim, and um, that was a very scary moment for them too. So. I think my dad's still got Genja's number, and even get even Ellis messaged my parents afterwards. Not not a lot of people know that, but just to say he's all okay, and I think that was a special touch. And um, yeah, a really good boy uh, on and off the field. Love that. You're what? You're out for four minutes, I reckon. Yeah, I only I only woke up properly like in the ambulance on the way to on the way to the hospital, um, and I remember for like the next four or five weeks after that. You know, I was struggling with like dizziness still and waking up feeling like I just had a huge night out with the boys and was going to spew and yeah, it was it was terrible. Um, but yeah, no, I was extremely lucky and it was my first big, big concussion. So I've I've been alright. Um, but yeah, massive thanks to to Genji's top top boy. Good on him. Just quickly moving on to. France versus Wales. Get your thoughts, Seb, on... G Galtier said after the match that he hopes that teams are now scared of France and they're definitely the number one team to beat going into a home World Cup. Is that how you would see it, having played them? Not really. I think if you if you match them physically up front, like we did in the, in the first game, I think they're there to be beaten. Um, but they are massive. I think... This year, by far the biggest and most physical team that that I played. Um, they're just big, big boys, and I think a big loss for them was Antonio. Um, you know, I think he got suspended or banned or whatever. I think he's a he's a huge, he's a big, big boy, um, and uh, I just think they're they're very physical. So if you try and get up 
you know, and meet that physicality, then you can you can beat them. But uh, there's no doubt they've got quality all over the field and probably one of the favourites going into the World Cup. But I definitely think that, you know, the pressure's on them. They've got obviously that home pressure, which which will be tough. Um, but yeah, I definitely think they're there for the taking. I don't think, you know, no one needs to be scared of them. Um, I say that we've got them in our in our group, so it's gonna be a t- <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a tough one. We've we've got New Zealand and them in our group, so it'll be very tough. But yeah, but beat you know, I beat them, like you said, he like managed to get one of those, and then you've got Uruguay and Namibia, is it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, win the World Cup, mate. Easy as that. Hundred percent. Why not? Um, but yeah, like 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 I said, I, I just think you know, give it shits against them, try and beat, try and match them physically, get in their face um, early on and try and put them under a bit of pressure. And yeah, I think there's definitely ways to beat them. I don't think they're, you know, I don't think, you know, I've seen, I've seen better teams. So um, yeah. Who would, you, who, who would you say superior to them at the moment? No, Ireland, just because of the pace that they play at. And um, I just think their rack speed and everything so fast. So um yeah, I think it's really tough to play against Ireland when they're on top of you, um, and the way they move the ball, and you know, they I don't, I don't know if they've peaked too early, um, but mm-hmm. they're 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 a top team at the moment, and for sure, yeah, one of the favourites. You won't have you won't have watched the France Wales game, were you? Because you would have been in the change room. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't like France, France just absolutely finished them after fifty odd minutes ran in some really simple tries. Wales in the first fifty odd minutes were their defence was shocking. The way that France keep the ball quick is by offloading obviously. You yeah. had big um Dante running one in really really easy. Nick he, Tompkins missed a, yeah. a he's a big he's a he's a big plus in their team at twelve, Dante, because it gives a, them a focal point in that midfield, which they probably missed against us. Yeah. Um, but you know when you've got a focal point like that, that's why I think England need to need to play Manu. Um, you know, I think Scotland of you, know, you know they've got two a lot I think's made a huge huge difference. If you've got a focal point in that midfield, I think it's massive. Um, so yeah, I think it, he makes a huge difference to that French team. Max, did you see Antonio when he was pretty much in the centres? He he came back. He was back for that game. And he... Mate, yeah, massive. he was glass man. Scrum they get out the back, and there he is in the centres, yeah. running in tries. The first, his first carry against us, against Italy and Rome, he ran over me. Genuine. I tried to, I try, I tried to get in the the lowest, best position to tackle someone, and he's just used me as a speed bump, and my whole right side of my body went numb. Oh, he's a big old and, boy. And like, just you know, when you get a stinger, and the whole, you know, you don't yeah. you feel anything for like three, four minutes. I was like, oh, oh it's the goodness. worst, isn't it? You're like, please yeah. come back, please come back soon. <laughs> I was like, doing, uh-huh. like trying to. Trying to do this, then yeah, I yeah. get the thing <laughs> But please come back. <laughs> yeah, it was it was tough. He's a big, big unit. Yeah. Well, boys, with that in mind, I'm gonna start with you, Max. France versus Ireland in Paris, both teams at full strength at a World Cup. Who comes out on top? Oh, in it's... Paris. In Paris, the je ne sais quoi. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go with France. Just because that that that's just they're such patriots. The 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 pride would be just it would be hard to surmount such an obstacle, even if you're Ireland. That's tough, man. Yeah, with how clinical Ireland are, with the way they play their game. Look at Ireland. France giving away loads of penalties. What because they're too aroused. <laughs> because they're <laughs> so horny over aroused. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> that's the only way they're losing yeah just so horny <laughs> just stand in front because we were too horny yeah just uh, <laughs> just yeah, emotional uh, emotional um, so yeah. I'm, I'm yeah I'm back in Ireland on that one right at this moment in time I'm going I'm going Ireland Seb yeah I think you know I think Ryan touched on discipline there I think that's a big big thing um, so yeah if they if they're struggling in that area you know, I think I back I back Ireland. So you obviously played a fair few test matches yourself. Is that Ireland side the best you've ever played against? Yeah, I would think so. Um yeah, I just think also they've created huge depth. So it doesn't really matter if one or two of their guys get injured. I think the guys that come in do a really good job. So yeah. Yeah, across the whole board, I'll probably say that's the strongest island island side. Um but yeah, anything can happen. You know, there's still 
a fair fair while to go until the World Cup. You know, obviously loads of things can happen, so we'll see. But I also think the Irish, you know, the whole union and how Irish rugby is run and those guys get managed so well. And I think um, they'll get looked after now through Leinster and I think they'll be ready to go when it comes to the World Cup. They'll be, like, put in, well, they'll be put in the fridge. They'll be put in the fridge now for a couple of weeks. Um, they won't be having to play the Lions this Saturday. Um, and I think they'll get looked after. World Cup sabbatical. Very nice. Yeah. Exactly. I could That's do it. with that. Imagine uh, like Dubai, Dubai for a nice week or two. Um, yeah. oh, that would be lovely. Yeah, you say that. What's the, what's the weather over there like at the moment? Surely it's not too bad. I'm actually, I'm, I've just booked in for some golf on Wednesday because it's 20 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is rained. Caramelized. It has rained yeah. here for the last week straight and probably about four degrees. So, yeah. Before we jump in to uh, your incredible rise over the last couple of years, you take us through who makes your, your Six Nations Ultimate 15 for this championship. Oof, has he been prepped on this? Yeah, I have been prepped. Oh, that's right. Um, but I've got... <laughs> like, fuck, that's, 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 that's so harsh. That's so harsh. I've been prepped. I've got to, I'm not going to. I'm not going to name any of my teammates because, um, yeah, I think that would be unfair. I think you know mentions do in my team. Fisketti at loose has been awesome. I think Roots has been class at five. I um, like him, by the way. He's good. Yeah, I think 39, 39 takes at in the line out this the Six Nations. I think that must be close yeah, to one good. of the, the top ever. So I think he runs the line out awesome. It, and yeah, I he think... must be calling to himself all the time though. <laughs> well he's just got me in the line out so he doesn't call to me. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Then. <laughs> um and then Brex at 13's been awesome. But my team of the Six Nations, um Schumann at one, you know, I think he's been class, gets through a lot of work. Uh Sheehan at two, uh Bielham at three. Uh, four. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right or wrong. Flamant, Flamant. Yeah, Flamant. Um, yeah. At four, James Ryan five, Olivon at six, uh, seven, Van der Fleer, Doris at eight, Dupont nine, Finn Russell at ten, Van der Merwe, beast of a man at eleven, um, Turpalotu at twelve, Gail Ficou thirteen, at fourteen, Mac Hansen and fifteen, Ramos. Mm. I put for yeah, Sk- I'd, I'd put Fisetti in there. Yeah, oh, Fisetti's yeah. been man. He's class in the work he gets through. Has been, man, he's he's been unbelievable. And I, th- I honestly think thirteen Brex defensively has got to be up there with one of the best defensive thirteens. You know, without him, it's a massive loss for us. And then, like I said, the way Roots has run our line out's been been class. Um, yeah, couldn't vote for myself either. Was it? Am I right in saying there was no English players in there? No English, no English players. No. <laughs> I just that just tells you how they're just off form. That's all no, why not? I, yeah, I was I gonna put Freddie uh, Stewart. Gonna, Stewart. To be fair, I was I was gonna Stewart's been good, and I was gonna put Farrell in there at twelve for bands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Big old Freddie Stewart. Uh, oh, actually, just one word, Seb. For uh, just a quick line from you. Before we get into your career, which match was the most frustrating? That's taking right. the whole Six Nations for you, probably Scotland, surely. Yeah, I'd say the most frustrating was probably Scotland because I think we we're twenty centimeters from scoring. That's how close it was, and you know, also I think also just the whole emotion of the Six Nations and in the last game we wanted to get over the line. Um, so that was probably the most frustrating. So, but I'm just going to ask: do you, you don't actually get a wooden spoon, do you? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know, genuine, because and also like after the game, I had like all these fans outside in Scotland and Edinburgh. They were like, "Seb, Seb, can we get a picture?" And then like I would get the phone and like do a selfie, and then every one there's a wooden spoon. Oh, and I was like, "These bastards. guys taking." I was like, "These yes. bastards taking the piss, man." <laughs> I thought they were like genuine Seb fans, like, oh, Seb, come get a pick or whatever. So I was like, <laughs> oh, this is putting me into a little bit of a, of a better mood. I'm like actually known around here. And then get the phone <laughs> out, like, oh, no, don't worry, lads, I'll take the picture, I'll take the picture, get it. And then all of them have got like the wooden spoon and the pick. I'm like, shit, <laughs> shit, housery is another level. Yeah, but I, yeah. I, I, that was a genuine question. I didn't know, you know, they always talk about the wooden spoon. I didn't know if there's actually a wooden spoon They're kicking uh, it out. I have no idea. I got three. I got loads here, though, from every Six Nations, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and a final one on that, on the frustration in Wales, uh, your captain, Mikel Onomoro, he gave that pretty stern post-match interview. I don't know if you mm. saw it. You were saying, look, it's just not good enough. You can have awesome games against Ireland and France. Then you're not performing well when you think that you might beat somebody else. Yeah. Was that actually aimed at you guys? Yeah, I think a little bit. Yeah, and I agree with him. I think, you know, some, you've got to be hard on yourselves. Uh, I said to the boys straight after the game too, you know, keep our feet on the ground, lads. Like, yeah, we've done well against Ireland and France, but we haven't got over the line. Um, you know, we're getting that respect and credibility back, but at the end of the day, we've got to get results too. So, um, yeah, I think that was directed a little bit at us and, yeah, I completely agree with him. I think, you know, we take the, the positives of, you know, everyone saying how well we're doing, but, you know, when we when we get criticised, we also got to take that on the chin. So, yeah, I think I think he was right. Okay, so let's take you back now to when you were growing up in Zimbabwe on a farm with your family, yeah. but life changed dramatically for you when you were forcefully removed from your home when Mugabe's supporters started to raid your farm. Yeah. Can you tell us your sort of memories and recollections of of that horrific time? Yeah, listen, it was a it was a tough tough time for me and my family. Obviously, I was I was still young. Um, but yeah, when your dad walks into the house and you know you're hearing sort of gunshots in the background, and he sort of says, "Come into the living room, guys," and then tells you to go and pack a small bag um, that we're going to go away for a while. You know, you, you know it's not good. So um, yeah, I just did what my dad said, um, probably for the first time, and um, went into my room and packed a small bag, got my cricket bat. I remember getting my cricket bat. Um, yeah, getting into the living room and then dad saying, quietly, guys, now into the car. All the lights were turned off of the car. You could hear gunshots on the farm. Um, got into the car with, yeah, with uh, with dad and the siblings and looked out the back window. And, yeah, we, we drove off our farm slowly, quietly off the back roads. And yeah, I remember my house just in the distance and I yeah, never saw home again. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty tough. And, you know, we're lucky, but... You know, my dad did everything to to protect us, to protect the family. You know, when you're sort of given, you know, the choice of, you know, we're going to destroy your house and your family and, you know, we'll work from your sister up or get off the farm in 12 hours. Um, you know, I don't think there's much, you know, you got to you got to move quickly. And I, I think my dad was, parents were awesome. And that's why I've got such huge respect for them. I think, you know, when, when you've given, when you've, you give everything to your family after something so tough like that and sort of the way they were so positive in life and gave us kids, you know, everything. I think they're massive role models to me. And you know, every time I, I play for, for Italy or for do anything in life, I just want to make them proud. So I sort of carry that with me. And um, yeah, but listen, I think everyone has their own tough time in life. I think everyone has a, has a difficult time in their life. That's mine. Um, but it's sort of how you bounce back and how you stay positive through through that. And I was lucky that it sort of brought my family even closer together. And I'm extremely lucky and, and grateful for that. How old were you? I think I was six eh, at the time. Yeah. So you know, you know, you know what's going, you know what's going on. Like you're not stupid. Um, obviously, I've got two older brothers, so they know even more than me, and they just kept me calm. Um, younger sister, so. It's not like you're just putting one kid in the car. You you know, there was four of us. Um, and, you know, we had a huge operation, you know, three farms, um, horses, you know, tobacco, tobacco, maize, cattle. You know, my dad employed over a thousand people. You lose that in tw 12 hours. Then, ah. you know, it's, ah. you know, very, very difficult. So, yeah, listen, it was really tough. And then, yeah, I remember going into the city center. We had a house where, my grandfather was my nonno, so my dad's dad, who was an Italian, and um, he had a house there, and we stayed there for for six months to a year, and and then after that, you know, the country was going getting worse and worse, and mum and dad decided to take us down to South Africa, mainly for mainly for schooling and to get us into good schools and to give us the best opportunity at life, and yeah, extremely lucky that we got into good schools, and um, yeah, it was it was awesome, so. Um, yeah, it was difficult. And, you know, I think my mum went back a few days to try and get things off the farm. She was held hostage, um, which was also really hectic. Um, the Italian embassy had to get involved and that was tough. And then cut three, four years later, 
you know, my uncle and aunt were, so my my mum's brother was still on their farm in Zim and, you know, they got almost beaten to death. You know, they broke my my aunt's arms, cheekbone, cut my uncle's ear. Um, so I think we were lucky at times, you know, a lot of people lost their lives and was, were, you know, a lot worse than us. Um, but yeah, extremely difficult a difficult time but you know lots to be thankful for and that and that's why you know during that time my italian family was was there for us helped us loads financially and you know we're, we're there for us so every time i play for italy i'm not only representing mum and dad and my family um, but i'm representing the italian side too and extremely proud of that you got a scholarship to go to hilton college when you moved to south africa yeah was there was there a drive from what had happened to you and being taken out of your home to make sure that you you grab this new opportunity yeah um obviously when you get given a scholarship and people believe in you um then you feel like you know you've got that belief and support to maybe go on to further things i wouldn't say it was fully on rugby because you know i thought cricket was maybe going to be my first option i really wanted to be maybe go pro in cricket um and then yeah i think at hilton you know it's so big on rugby and things that you know, my passion grew there. And then obviously I got an opportunity after school to go to Western province and then Italy came calling. And once I got a little taste of playing Italy 20s and then, you know, getting into that, uh, that's where I fully, you know, dove into to trying to play for Italy. And that was a dream of mine. Mate, how nice is Hilton College, by the way? Oh, mate, we're so lucky. Uh, we're so, so lucky. I was so, so lucky. Uh, incredible. Incredible. Mate, that game part. You guys have got a you guys yeah. got a little safari park without the big cats. Such yeah. a rough zebra what? down there. I was like, what is what? going on? Whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 that place no, bro, that no. place has got such a safari park, G. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a safari park on the on campus, the uh, golf, you know, the driving gym. range, putt putt, I think three gyms, rowing gym. Crazy. Um yeah, it's mad. Well, I was Every very we were very, very, very spoiled. Very, yeah, very South cool. African super soldiers just walking out the gym is nutty, and also the, the, the outdoor pools delightful. I was yeah. off that diving board left, right, and rhubarb. No, I it was awesome. down there. Yeah, couldn't trust us at school with a real javelin, let alone a tiger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they've got. I think they've. Got, have you guys got leopards in there? You do have leopards. Yeah, there was. Actually, yeah, yeah, there's leopards. Genuine, there was one spotted. I think two or three weeks ago, a leopard spotted on Holtzum campus. And the thing is, Hilton, Hilton think it's a good idea to take, you know, the whole class down there, hundred <laughs> pupils, and say, you know, yeah. sleep outside. Lose the twelve-year-old. Yeah. Oh, we're missing one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> one yeah, of the first beers got off by the leopard. Uh, mental. Yeah, mental. I was very, I was very, very lucky. It was yeah, you know, special, special school. After Hilton, you then moved to Hartbury College in England. Who? themselves apparently have a, a sort of a pretty funky initiation take us through that yeah um first of all you just come in your boxes then you have to go into like a chicken shop or whatever whatever it is you have to change boxes with your teammates there's like 20 30 guys in the in the chicken shop and the guys are like get out get out and like all of us are putting on each other's pants and then elephant walk through through the center of gloucester and yeah, drinking dirty pints, um, getting walloped by eggs. Um, yeah, I know it's it's pretty pretty hectic. I think maybe some cat it's an food. Elephant walk. It was an elephant walk. Is oh, I can't really. Should I try and show you? Yeah, try and show right. me. There. It's like when you I don't know, like tank. You have to hold your <laughs> the other bloke through your your legs and like sort of walk like that. Well, I don't know so you, hold it. on, you hold on to the bloke in front of his penis or arm. No, his arm, which is oh. basically his, <laughs> which is basically his penis, yeah. Right. Um, and then yeah, you march through the center and you're getting walloped by eggs, and but it's a good crack. It brings everyone together. It's good. Uh, right there, you are. another challenge accepted by me and Matt. Yeah, that's <laughs> nothing <laughs> quite like yeah, a good bit of humiliation <laughs> to get everyone together. I love it. That's Max's punishment for uh, for missing the pod last week. He's got. To... It wouldn't be the first. It won't be the last. <laughs> <laughs> So while still at college, uh, in 2016, you're called up to the Italian squad. You make your debut yeah. in, in um, San Jose against the USA. What's your best memory of that? Day? Um, yeah, just uh, I think it was special that I was with Italy A before I got called up. 
and I was actually just with my dad. We were out having a day off. We had just played against Argentina A. Um, and I was sitting with my dad when I got the call. So I think that was pretty special to obviously whatever all everything that had happened with the family, with my whole journey, and then for my dad to be there with me when I got my first call was was awesome. Um, and then I just remember being so jet lagged because I had to fly from Bucharest to London, then London to San Francisco, and then joint and I thought I was just going to go there and hold tackle bags and Connor's called me in straight away and said Seb listen we're struggling with injuries you're going to you're going to be you're going to make your debut you're going to be on the bench so he was like get used to the line outs and and get all the calls and stuff so I was nervous but you know thankfully it all went okay and I was still a youngster obviously I was still at uni um, and it was pretty good I remember just winning against the states and then winning again against canada and just getting a good win bonus and then taking that money after the tour going back to hartbury as a student and going shit i've got quite a bit of money here and <laughs> saying to my dad dad what should i do <laughs> what should i do with it and dad's just like you deserve it enjoy so for the next year and a half i was just buying boo booths for everyone vip <laughs> bottles <laughs> i was just acting like such a such a <laughs> you went such full van wilder <laughs> Oh, I was just like, it's on me, it's on me, lad. So, yeah, I was a bit, I was just a bit of a chop, but no, it was awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it was good, good memories. And obviously, you know, I didn't, I never thought that I was going to get called up again, especially in the in the near future. Um, so, yeah, it was mainly just focused on Hartbury getting the degree, and then after that, I signed with Benetton, and then yeah, obviously Connor was monitoring me and called me back in, so it was awesome. When you went in, I'm guessing you didn't speak very much Italian. So I what... still, I still, I still don't. <laughs> yeah, I know. But what happens <laughs> when you get roped in and you've got people calling lineouts in Italian? Yeah, it, it does that? get it does get tricky. It does get tricky. Um, obviously now I'm, I understand basically 100, percent and my Italian's not the worst. I wouldn't say it's great, but it's not bad. Um, but yeah, I know it's tough, especially when it comes to lineouts and. I remember playing with Sergio as well. And if you missed detail or, you know, you'd get into you. So it was also stressful. Um, but now we've got Kieran as our head coach and he hardly speaks anything. So it's awesome. So it's perfect. Did you also <laughs> have to learn how to smoke 20 fags a night when you were with Sergio Porte? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's, in the, it's in the culture. It's in the culture. <laughs> it's awesome. I think it's class. And it's, cheap, <laughs> and it's cheaper than the UK. <laughs> Okay, I'll never forget I, when I went to one of those after match functions, and it, that was like yeah. a big White House up on the hill. Yeah, ninety like, percent. I'm sure we. I'm sure we had a cigarette together after the. Oh uh, no, I wasn't smoking. I, was smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember going out and big Jim was there, and there's uh, there's Sergio out with a Marlboro Red. I'm like, hold on, man, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's in the culture, but it's good. Yeah. Did you come across Jake Pelagri at, at Harpery? Yeah, so we played together at Hartbury, um, I think two years or three years, and then obviously into the Italy side where you know he made his debut against Scotland, and I'm sure he bumped off Ryan at some know. point. I only saw that about a hundred times this week. It was all, it was all over the shop. <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw that. And obviously, I was like, oh goodness. Nah, but yeah, he's he was. We obviously played together at Hartbury, and so strong, like just Very. mong strength, and just does like bare bare minimum in the gym uh, just laughs at me laughs at my calves laughs at my body and then he just bumps people and nah, he's yeah he was so strong there so I always knew that he was going to go on to really good things and unfortunately about his you know he's been through a hell of a lot you know with his injury and you know with his brother and his whole family so mate he's been through a hell of a lot but it was so special to play with to have him back in the side for a short period of time, obviously played against England and then got injured, done his shoulder. So he's going through a tough time at the moment, but I'm sure he'll be back. And he's obviously signed with Zebra now for next year. So it's another big opportunity for him to just get back playing. And I'm sure, you know, once he gets back playing, he'll be he'll be back bumping boys. I always, um, and when we play Zebra, I always forget that uh, um, Kovacic is there. Yeah, yeah. Matt Kovacic he's, is there. Yeah. He's a tough bloke as well. Yeah. I bet he can brawl in a pub. <laughs> Probably uh, he's just so thick set, but I'm not. Oh, he's not. Much, he's not speaking much Italian, surely. None of us do, Ryan. None of us do. Um, 
Right, right. I might see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come over here. <laughs> Max, you coming? Oh, man, I, I can so be down for that. A little bit of Itai living, absolutely. What a place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a culture. You can't be here. Every time I come over there, when I come... Where I couldn't go over the espresso, like how good espressos are there, but you just can't oh, get yeah. the same anywhere else. They're just like... And everyone's drinking them like syrup. Like the whole time you've got an espresso <laughs> in your hand. And everyone's got perfectly tailored clothes. Every <laughs> man's dog looks perfectly dressed. We're a bunch of slobs in England. You walk around Bristol, you're like, everyone's just in track pants and freebie T-shirts. Walk around in Parma. My God. Same with um, Treviso. Unbelievable. Everyone's yeah. got their tailor and they look... There's some posh, there's some posh people, yeah. posh people around here for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, Italian aristocracy is a real thing for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just going to finish off with our quick fire round. Right. And the first thing that comes into your head, and then we'll roll from there. <clears throat> best, okay. best player you've ever played against? That's tough, man. Uh, Brian Camilo. Oh, like it. Best player you've ever played with? I'm going to say Jaden Hayward. He was our 15. Biggest fight you've witnessed in training? Probably yeah, me at Hartbury uh, with one of the older blokes. He was just on, I think I, I like led him with a forearm and got angry. Do you remember who it was? Stephen Pape. It was Papey. So like some, some big, big second row and I've led him with a forearm. He's had me on the ground going, I'm going to F you up. And I was like, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Who was the big um the big set of herps? He said like Yeah, herps. He's he met in training, he's written some people off. Um beast of beast of a man. You don't want to be cleaned by that guy. Oh, his fingers used to wander very close to my eyes. <laughs> yeah, you know? I remember <laughs> I remember, I remember you 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 were you're saying against Benetton, you're like, What is I my eyes are F, my eyes. Dirty bastard! Who's that? You know, he's in. He's at Quinns now, yeah. Yeah, he's at Quinns. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he, he yeah. He's. I he's, think he's done. He's done one or two of his teammates' knees, and yeah, yeah. Um, he, he, cleans, he cleans a bit differently, doesn't he? Yeah, I, he's tested <laughs> my suspension out. My God, yeah. He, he's he's had a he's had a few fallouts and training and stuff, I even with coaches. That. He's just gone. Oh, I'm not happy. I'm not happy, and then he just goes back. <laughs> Who's the player who's rubbed you up the most the wrong way? Owen Farrell. <laughs> nah, no one really, to be to be fair. Um, probably Ryan wouldn't be far off that list when we play against Glasgow. <laughs> he's, always got to, he's always got something to say. <laughs> 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 no, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, to be fair, I've had no, no real run-ins with anyone, to be fair. No, I was always all right with Treviso. I know I wound a few people up, like big old Herbst. And who was the hooker? Five, was it? Yeah, Hummy, yeah. He used to lose his head, man. He used to lose yeah. his head. Um, was yeah. it Monty, Monty on the wing? Yeah, Monty on the wing. But then I had a good few mates there. You know, yourself, yeah. Buddy, Dean Bud, legend. Yeah, man. good so, man, good man. You get him with a few of them. That's what you do. You get him with a few of the boys. So then, yeah. nah, he's all right, really. He's all well, right. you know... Well, you can say hi to me next time we play, because you're always big dog. You're always big dogging us. <laughs> I'm just always blowing out my ass. <laughs> Three people in a cab with you for the biggest party of your life. I'm going to go Marcus Watson. Oh, what? Um, he told me a story idiot. about you today. Actually, I said oh. I'm doing a podcast with you. It was like oh. something about UFC moves or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> um, so I'm going Marcus Watson, Dean Budd, because, yeah, we've been on loads of nights out together and he's pissed on me in Amsterdam and, yeah, it's just a good <laughs> laugh. So Dean Budd, Marcus Watson, and then Tommy Allen. Tommaso. It's Tom Tommaso, not Tommy. Tommaso. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with Tommy because he's my roomie, so I can't leave him alone. Sadly, that is all the time we've got left in this week. Huge thank you to Ryan and to Max as always. And an even bigger thank you to Seb. Good luck with the rest of your URC season. And thanks for your time. And thank you all for listening and watching. We'll see you all next week. Grazie mille.